Our blessed Lord and Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings upon our life, your presence. We thank you, Lord, that your word makes it clear that you are our helper and our ever-present help in times of need. Lord, worldwide, this is a time of need. Thank you that you stand by, encourage, help, and supply all of our needs according to your riches in your glory. And thank you, Lord, that today your word is feeding us. Amen. Everybody has scriptures that they would perceive or they believe to be some of their favorite scriptures. Those are the scriptures that we like to fall back on and sometimes when we go through difficult times, we speak them into our lives to make us feel better, to uplift us, to, to, uh, to bless us, to give us the courage to go forward and to give us the hope that everything is going to be okay. One of those scriptures that I often quote, I'm sure all of you are aware of it, comes from the book of Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. It says, I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Look at your neighbor and say, not to harm you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. Now, you can argue this point as much as you want, but you can't get away from the fact that God is saying to us in His Word that it is the heart's desire to bless you. Look at your name and say, God wants to bless you. Now, I am fully aware that some of you sitting here today, your circumstances right now seem to be the opposite of I am blessed. Well, I'm not asking you to look at your circumstances. I'm asking you to look at the Word of God. Because you see, what God says is more important than what we see. Because God is eternal and what we see can change tomorrow. It can change at the drop of a pin. In fact, some of your situations could already have changed and you're just not aware of it. It just needs to break through. You know, life is like that. Sometimes we have these massive big problems or these big issues sitting on us and we like have these worms in our stomach eating away at us and we, we can't see through all the murkiness and the darkness that things are going to be okay and then just suddenly one day, boom, it's gone. And you can't really explain how it disappeared or what happened. It's just things fell into place and you're in a better place. Why? Because God is good. Amen. Because God sees us through our difficult times. Okay, so it is God's plan. It is God's heart's intention for each of us to live a blessed and prosperous life. Re repeat after me. Blessed. blessed. Prosperous. prosperous. Okay. If you're not at that place yet, fasten your seatbelt because God's taking you there. Amen. Amen. You have to have an expectation that God is taking your life from a bad place to a good place, from a low place to a high place. Okay. So why then is there so many people who are obviously not even close to living the life that God has planned for them? It's a good question, isn't it? Because when we look at it, we could say, okay, well, it looks like that one is blessed and that one is blessed, but that one is obviously battling and this one has all these issues and that one has all those problems. So why? Why are our churches full of people whose lives are seemingly falling apart? Why are there so many people suffering under poverty? Why is there so many people that seem to have no hope and possibly have either no peace or no joy? Well, firstly... Let me remind you that in your relationship with God, God is the perfect one, you are not. And I know there's a couple of people here that view themselves as being perfect, but let me pop your bubble. In God's eyes, you can never be. Because you are the one that battles with sin. God does not. Amen? So, this simply means that if you are not living God's promise, then the problem is obviously not God. Doesn't the Bible say God is not a man that he should lie? So if he's not lying about the fact that he wants you to prosper, then that means something else must be going on in your life right now that probably needs to be sorted out or dealt with for you to get to that place. You know what? If I bring you a brand new car, what car would you like? Yeah, good. What's the car's again? 
Gold. He wants a gold. I like your thinking. Yeah, it's a, it's a good goal. You could have you could have aimed a bit higher, but it's fine. The simple life is a good life. You want a golf? I take. I bring you a brand new golf. I park it in your front yard. You all excited. You all happy. You can't wait to get out there. Maybe you heard there's a dice somewhere in the town, and you want to go and tie on your golf and see how it goes. And then you go in there and you turn the key. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? And you turn the key. Now that that knows not a problem. Now there's a big problem. What's the problem? It's no petrol. Yeah. And I fully understand that because I saw the petrol price. I mean, okay. yeah. like really bad. But the thing is, it's up to you to put the petrol. I can give you everything. You can have the best of everything. You still have responsibilities. And God has given us all everything we need, but we still have responsibilities. And the question is not, is God good? The question is, what are we doing with our responsibilities? Are we taking good care of the things we should be doing to make it work? So, you see, the promises of God in the Word of God is clearly given to us as yes and amen. But the fulfillment thereof has a lot to do with us. Look at your neighbor and say, it's up to you. Listen to me carefully, and maybe you're not going to like what I say now, but it's not just up to God. It's up to you too. And that's the difference between different people. You know, there's a meme that I saw a while ago of two guys. One is a beggar sitting by the side of the road with his hand out. The other one you can see is a very smartly dressed gentleman with his like little Doberman pincher and his little, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, handkerchief stuffed in there with his little hat on and looks all too smart and he's sitting next to the um, he's sitting next to the beggar and somebody asks them you're a beggar and you're a millionaire what can happen and both of them answer my father was an alcoholic so the beggar became an alcoholic because his father or the beggar became a beggar because his father was an alcoholic man because his father was an alcoholic what's the difference attitude the difference is attitude you know it's what we do with life it's what we do with the promises of God it's what we do with the challenges that are set before us you know some people see a challenge they go sit down they say oh woe is me oh me oh my I want to die other people see challenges they say bring me my bring me my my climbing gear i'm going to climb this mountain I'm, this is no problem for me god's going to help me everything is going to be okay and sometimes we need to have that kind of an attitude you can learn a lot about all of this by looking at some of the things that happened to the israelites and let me just remind you the main reason why we read the old testament is for us to see how God interacted with His people and to learn the principles that govern the relationship between us and God. Genesis 15 verse 18 says, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, Unto your seed I have given this land. Okay, so God says, Abraham, listen carefully. This land belongs to you and I'm giving it to your descendants. This will be their land so he receives a promise that his descendants the Israelites are going to live in this land what was that land called who can help me Canaan it was called Canaan now the interesting thing is it took 400 years for the promise of God to be fulfilled now some people might say but that's not right but the fact is it was fulfilled God never said when it's the same when God says to you that He wants to prosper you. He doesn't say it's going to happen tomorrow. He says, hold on to your horses. Fasten your seatbelts. Something is coming. But let me just throw this out there. It's not part of my sermon, but it's good for us to talk about these things. How many of you know that God tests you? The Bible is full of places where the Word of God says people were tested. You know, when God gives you a big promise, you must understand that there will be days that God will test you to see whether you still believe or whether you've given up hope. And if you've given up hope, you must understand something, you've given up the promise. 
when everything starts going wrong and you're like, ah, this is rubbish. Ah, no, this is, God is expecting way too much of me. Ah, I don't understand why I have to suffer like this. You've lost. You failed the test. Because it's men and women of faith, of virtue, of godly character that keeps going even when it looks like everything is against them. And they are the ones that get to the top. But let me say it's not just men and women of God. It's people in general. You know that multi-millionaire? He didn't become one overnight. And you know how many of these people that reached the top went bankrupt once, twice, three, four times, but they keep coming back and they try again. They keep coming back and they try again. Even God has to bless a man like that. Why? Because he keeps on going. He keeps on fighting. He refuses to give up. Amen? Amen. And then we have Christians that do bogger all. They sit on the couch and they... You know, have a lot of things to say about people like that where they should be going out there and doing something for themselves. We can't fall into a trap that we now want God to do everything and we're like, oh, but listen, my, my, my role in this equation is just to be there. No, you've got to do something. You know, there's a lot of people that want a lot, but they want to give very little to get there. It takes hard work to succeed in anything. And we have to do our part. Things don't just happen. So... It took 400 years for this promise to be fulfilled. I'm just going to go quickly to what happened. Exodus, Exodus 3 verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. Listen to me. I know your sorrows. I don't care who you are. God knows what's going on in your life. Even though you sometimes feel He doesn't. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God sent Moses to start the process of bringing the Israelites from the curse to the blessing. Say, to, say with me, from the curse, from the curse to, the blessing. to the blessing. God doesn't want you to remain in darkness. God doesn't want you to remain a slave. Slavery is satanic. It's bondage. God wants to deliver us from bondage and He wants us to be free. Amen. Okay. I want you to hear clearly what God's plan and purpose is. Firstly, he has heard the cries of Israel at the hands of their oppressors and he says, I am going to deliver them. Okay. Not only will he deliver them, but he's also now going to fulfill an earlier promise made 400 years earlier to Abraham that these people will inherit the land of God's promise. So Exodus 5 verse 1. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go. Moses follows all God's instructions. Moses confronts Pharaoh. He gives him an ultimatum. Now, you could be forgiven that Moses probably thought as well, like, I'm going to go there, I'm going to say, I've come on behalf of God, this is going to happen, and things are, it's going to sort of be plain sailing. Take into account the reason he knows who God is is because he saw the burning bush. And let me just remind you, there was no weed back then. It was really a burning bush. Then something happened that nobody really expected. God hardens Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh becomes stubborn. He also begins to treat the Israelites much harsher as a result of Moses' visit. Moses goes there on behalf of God to say to Pharaoh, God, the God of the heavens, the creator of heaven and earth, the Lord of all, the great I am, the Lord God Almighty, has sent me here to say to you, you better let the people go. And then the poor boy hit the fan. Then the wheels came off. Listen to what happened. Exodus seven verse eight. Uh, Exodus five verse seven to eight. 
You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. These people are lazy. That's why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. So in other words, not only are they not leaving, now they have to work twice as hard in the same time to produce the same amount of bricks that they used to produce before. How many of you know Moses wasn't popular then? <laughs> when the promise comes from God, things, not, uh, things may not immediately look up. In fact, it does happen that sometimes the promise comes and things suddenly become a lot worse. But I want you to notice that all of this, God is still working. We sometimes feel that because the Pope has hit the fan, God has left the building. No. God is still around. God has a plan. Look at your name and say, God has a plan. We have to keep reminding ourselves that God has a plan. When you look only at the circumstance, and you look no longer at God, you become like Peter who starts to sink. The world is full of sunken Christians. What happens when you sink in the water? You drown. There's a lot of people that are not enjoying the living water. They have sort of passed out in the living water because they are no longer walking. They're not trusting. They're not believing. Isaiah 55 verse 9, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so thy ways are higher, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God speaking. As the heavens are higher than the earth. In other words, God's thinking is so much more advanced, so much more intricate, so much above our understanding that you can compare it by standing here and looking up at the heavens above. That means that when you look at your situation right now, compared to God, you literally see nothing. But that also means that when you've decided it's the end, it might just be the beginning because you can't see. When you've decided it's hopeless, it might be very hopeful. You can't see. Because God's ways are very different. And God's thinking is very different to ours. So put yourself in the Israelites' shoes. Moses rock up there and convinces them that God sent him. He proves it by signs and wonders. He put his staff down and became a serpent. It bloomed. All sorts of things happened. And the Israelites said, okay, fine, you can be our spokesman. And then as he goes to Pharaoh, you can see a couple of the old toppies sitting there. Mm, I hope this is not going to be problems for us. Yeah. And the next day they're like, yeah, you see, I thought this was going to be problems for us. Yeah. <laughs> nobody expected it to go there. And nobody knew that this was part of the process. You see, sometimes to get from where I am today to where God's promise is, God has to take me through a process of changing me of shaping me, of forming me, of sometimes transforming me. Because the promise God gave me requires a different kind of me. A stronger me. A more diligent me. A better conditioned me. A me with more faith. Who can I use as an example? What's your name again? Veronica. 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 Somebody comes to you at the age of, let's say, 15, 16. Okay, well, we'll make it 20. <laughs> at the age of 20, and they say, wow, you're such a beautiful person. What, what, what? We're going to enter you in the Miss Universe contest. And you're like, oh, wow. I'm so flattered. What? This is such a bargain. Like great stuff, you know. 
But you've never been exposed to that life. You've never been exposed to that lifestyle. And suddenly they put you on a stage. Mm -hmm. They put you in a fancy dress. You look very pretty. And then they start asking you all those funny questions that they like to ask. And nobody has prepared you. And you're like, um, 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 um. And like, the chances are you will fail. Because unless you are prepared correctly, you can't walk that road. The same way that maybe um, Gozi gets a word that God's going to send him all over the world like Benny Hinn. He's going to preach to thousands. He's going to go from country to country. And he's like, oh wow, can't wait to get home. Says to his wife, Louisa, listen, your babes, pack your bags, we going. Goes up to the boss, gives his resignation, oh. boom, couldn't wait to do that, like now I'm free. Sits in front of the telephone waiting because there's going to be a call. And by, well, by some miracle there's a call. Somewhere in Indonesia somebody heard that he's got a powerful word and they've got a stadium that can sit like 200,000 people and they can't wait for him to come. And then he goes there. And he walks out onto the stage. And he sees all those people. And he sees the expectation. And there's a whole bunch of sick people sitting there waiting for stuff. And he looks at that and his eyes go bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and the next thing he knows, he wakes up in intensive care because he had a stroke or <laughs> Why? Because he wasn't prepared. You see, here's something that you've got to understand. Now, I'm not cursing you. Is this the illustration? The thing is, what you must understand, for you to go from where you are now to where God wants you to be, a lot of things need to change. Because you, right now, where you are, probably can't cope with what God has for you there. It's a process. We will not always understand what God is doing. In fact, often, it will be impossible for us to understand. Doesn't the Bible say what eye hasn't seen, what ear hasn't heard, what hasn't entered the heart of man, God has prepared for those who love Him. In other words, there's many things that God has prepared for your life that you know nothing about. And you will not know nothing about it. And you will not know nothing about His plan to get you there. Okay. Yet this is when we need faith. The faith that God knows what He's doing, even if I don't. Israel, unfortunately, did not have this faith. <clears throat> Exodus 5 verse 21. And they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his servants, and you have put a sword in their hands to kill us all. So, the moment God's plan gets put into action and the, the ramifications or the repercussions or the changes that this needs to bring kicks in, the Israelites begin to fight. You know, we always say, don't kill the messenger. That day, that's how Moses fell. Hey, don't kill the messenger. They all turned against Moses. They saw, listen to this, they saw the signs, they saw the wonders that God gave Moses as proof that God was with him. Yet at the first sign of trouble, they doubt and they turn their back. They give up. And so it goes on. Then God comes and He gives ten plagues. They see the supernatural power of God in the plagues. They are protected. The Egyptians are not. But when Pharaoh refuses to let them go every single time, they fall apart. They fall apart. They fall apart. These people had a very bad attitude. And let me tell you something. People with a bad attitude never go nowhere in life. You don't have to be an Israelite. You don't have to be an Egyptian. You could be a South African. You could be a Portuguese. You could be a Lebanese. It doesn't matter. If you have a bad attitude, let me tell you, your life is not going to go very far. They expected God to ensure that there was never any problems. They did not like the fact that God exposed them to hardship. They couldn't handle the fact that there was turmoil. And when it came, they were very quick to blame God and turn their back on Him. 
We've said this many times, we're going to say it a lot. Life is tough. Down here is not for sissies. It's difficult. It's very difficult. But it's not impossible. And it has a lot to do with your outlook in life and it has a lot to do with your attitude in life. <clears throat> Exodus 13 verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, even though that was the shorter route. For God said, if these people face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Listen carefully to what, what's going on here. This is important. The, the Bible says, Exodus 13, 17, when Pharaoh let the people go. In other words, now they've had a victory. They are finally out of Egypt. They have crossed the sea. They are on the other side. They are starting their journey to the promise. God says the following. He says, God did not lead them through the road that leads through Palestine country. Why? It was the short route. But he says, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. God knew their hearts. From day one, these people did nothing but complain. They did nothing but moan. They did nothing but throw tantrums. At the first sign of a problem, they wanted to give up. Now here's where they are. Moses is standing on a mountain. God is talking to him and he's showing him, this is where we have to go. God says to him, if we take this route, it's a short route, it's going to take roughly eight days. You'll be where I want you to be. He says, but between here and there, some fighting is going to take place. I have seen these people of mine, they are stubborn, they are stiff-necked, and they are full of nonsense. And I've already seen that their attitude is, they will not tolerate hardship. So if I take them on this road, the first thing that's going to happen, there will be a fight, they will turn around and they will all go back. So they are forcing me not to take them this way, I now have to take them that way. Do you know what happened when we took the long way? Most of them never got there. Most of them never got there so yes there was a shortcut to the blessing israel had however shown god through their attitude that they could not take the shortcut <clears throat> they didn't have enough faith in god they were unwilling to endure any form of hardship to get to the promise and they refused to fight because of all of this they ended up spending 40 years in the desert <clears throat> Ultimately, there were two men, two men out of hundreds of thousands that made it. Who knows what their names were? Joshua and Caleb. The fulfillment of God's promise wasn't because they were special in any way. It's not because they were stronger or more agile or fitter or more sporty or anything. To, it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with attitude. Let's look at Caleb. Numbers 14 verse 24 says, Because my servant Caleb <coughs> has a different spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, I need a different spirit. Because of my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Wow. This man went to the land of promise. When everybody else, the Bible says everybody 19 years and older, God gave a declaration will fall in the desert and die. It was God's judgment and God's punishment on them for their willful disobedience, their lack of faith, their temper tantrums, etc. etc. 
but Caleb never did. Because God saw something different in Caleb. Caleb was a blessed man. He lived to see and receive the promise of God where thousands failed to do so. God ascribes his success in doing so to the fact that God perceived a different spirit in him. So, what was it that made up the different spirit that Caleb had? Who was Caleb? I'm going to give you some of his attributes. And then if you really want this different spirit, you're going to begin to pray and ask God for these attributes to come alive in your <coughs> own life. Number one, Caleb was a man of faith. Numbers 13 verse 30 says, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. When the spies came back, they came back with a very negative report. They went in, they went and spied out the promised land. They came back, I believe there was 12 of them. 10 of them said, People, 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 please. Are you oaks crazy? Are you oaks mad? Are you ludicrous? We can't go up against these people. They're giants. They're strong. They're powerful. They have technology that we don't have. We look like, I don't know if I'm quoted it here, but they say that we look like grasshoppers in their sight. <clears throat> Numbers 14 verse 9. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of this land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. I want to tell you something. What he did, yeah, it takes a lot of guts and I'll tell you why. Because all of Israel sided with the ten. He was the lone one, him and Joshua, were the two that stood up and said, this is rubbish. Look, it takes a lot of guts, a lot of determination, a lot of, geez, I don't know, that word that I can't say. To look these people, hundreds of thousands of them in the eye and put them in their place and say, what are you people talking about? I hear all your negative reports, but nobody says nothing about the fact that we serve a living God. Nobody says nothing about the fact that they've got some worthless idol protecting them, but we've got the creator of the heavens and the earth moving with us. You people should be ashamed of yourselves. Do not be afraid of them. Caleb had faith. Caleb had an unwavering faith in God's ability, not his own ability. He doesn't say there, we are strong. He says, God is with us. Listen to me. There's a lot of things you can't do. But I want to tell you something. God is with you. And that means there's a lot of things you can do. It's not because of us. It's in spite of us that a lot of people get to the top. A lot of people have massive, powerful victories. The other spies compared themselves with the Canaanites and felt like locusts. <coughs> oh, yes, that scripture. Numbers 13 verse 33 says, We saw the Nephilim there. The children of Anak came from the Nephilim. Now, if you don't know what the Nephilim are, the Nephilim was the people that was in the world as a result of fallen angels procreating with human beings, bringing a race of giants into the world. We saw the Nephilim there. The children of Anak came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in their eyes and we looked the same to them. Caleb, on the other hand, compared the Canaanites with God and said, these people are nothing. You see, the Israelites saw the size of the enemy. Caleb saw the size of God. And that changed everything in his life. The second thing that's very powerful about Caleb, he was a man of perseverance. 
What is perseverance? It's not never having the thought of giving up. It's never giving into it and fighting through it until something happens. Listen, yeah, everybody that has ever got anywhere in life has battled. Anything worth fighting for is going to be difficult. Amen? Amen. And God will make you fight for things many times because He wants to build character. He wants to build strength. He wants to build faith in your life. Caleb had to endure the desert for 40 years, just like all the other people. But can I tell you what happened to the other people? After 40 years of going around the same mountain, they became disillusioned, they became distracted, they became angry and frustrated, they became negative and bitter, and they gave up all hope. Caleb never did. Caleb kept going forward because he kept remembering there's a promise, there's a promise, there's a promise, there's a promise. And this is the thing, we can go through life and maybe you have some promise of God, a dream, a vision, a prophetic word that was spoken into your life. That you read the Bible and God put something in your heart or you just know that you called for something and day after day after day nothing happens. The devil will come and sit you on your shoulder and chili chili in your ear telling you, oh, just give it up. Ah, oh, it's never going to happen. Ah, oh, please, man. This, uh, it was all lies. But don't, remember, don't forget he's a deceiver. And he has a purpose to do that because he knows the promise is real. But he also knows something else. The promise is only fulfilled by those who persevere. Most people are their own worst enemies. Because they give up. The Bible says they that run the race till the end will receive the crown or the prize, depending on what you read. Those that run the race till the end, you know when you run a race, sometimes you become tired. Back in school days, we used to start shouting, ho, bien, ho, ho, bien, ho. Remember that? <laughs> and then that person would just like it, like they got their second wing. I remember Matthew once. You remember when you ran the 400 meters? You, you remember? We were at the stadium. And he's not a 400 meter athlete. I can't even remember why they pushed him in there. I don't think anybody else wanted to run. And let me tell you something about the 400 meters. It doesn't sound far, but man, let me tell you something. That can kill you, especially if you haven't trained. Very. And then there he went. But when he came past there, I think he was stone dead last. By like 100 meters. But when he came past, everybody began to cheer. Hey, I tell you what, the next moment they turbo kicked him. There he went. <laughs> Amen. We all have to find something to persevere with. Sometimes, and this is where sometimes it's good to be a good friend. Because sometimes people want to give up. And we need people around us to encourage us. Good friends won't let good friends stop, give up, fall by the wayside. Yeah. We encourage one another. Amen? Amen? We help one another. <laughs> Everyone around him was negative. They were upset. They were complaining. Yet he remained committed to God and to the vision that God had given him. The vision that he'd seen. Right now, the world is a very negative place. Right now, if you lend out your ears before long, you'll also end up in a gutter somewhere. It's for you right now to persevere. It's for you right now to keep running the race. It's for you right now to say, but God is still on the throne and I'm going to get to the other side. I don't care what people say. You know, it's like they say, it's not what some says. It's what he says that matters. <clears throat> Caleb was a man of encouragement. Numbers 14 verse 9. Caleb is speaking to the people and he says, And do not be afraid of the people of this land because we will swallow them up. Why is he saying that? Because the other ones said we locusts. And they look like, we look like locusts to them. He turns it around and he says, Listen, yeah, they're the locusts, we're not. Do not be afraid of these people because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. God saw this man standing up and saying to the people, stop your negativity. Stop
Stop your despondency. Stop your bitterness. Stop listening to the lies. This is the truth. God is in charge. Everything will be okay. I can tell you one thing. When this man was busy with that speech, God was smiling. God was happy. And that's why God says you have a different spirit. He shared his faith and his belief with others. He wasn't afraid to speak openly about his belief and about his faith. He tried his best to encourage others not to give up and to stand firm in their faith. Caleb was a man of loyalty. Let me say something. You can be upset with me if you want. You can be as offended. I don't care. The truth is the truth. There's very few loyal people left in the world today. People have no more loyalty. People today have become like a wave in the sea. Today we are, then we're there, then we're there, then we're there. And they wonder why God cannot bless them. You need to be loyal, people. Let me tell you something. You need to be loyal. Listen to this. When the people turned against Moses, <clears throat> who stood up for him? Caleb. Caleb stood up for him. When the people turned against Joshua, who stood up for him? Caleb. Caleb stood up for him. When the people rebelled against God, who stood up for him? Caleb. Caleb stood up for him. Caleb respected his leaders. He followed God with all his heart. And of course, this will change the way God sees a person. Moses, whether you like it or not, was probably one of the most blessed men in the world ever. And he was, with the exception of Christ, the strongest man of faith and leader that the world has ever seen. And when everybody turned against him, Caleb stood up for him. Because Moses was a man of God. And Moses could go to sleep knowing that there was at least one person that had his back. <clears throat> the next thing that is very powerful about Caleb is Caleb was not afraid to go and make war. Joshua 14 verse 10 to 12. Now then, just as the Lord has promised... He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So, here I am today, 85 years old. Yeah. You know, down here now, we, when we're 85 years old, you sit on the stoop and have a coffee. Yeah. This man was getting ready to put on his armor and go and have a, go and have a fight. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still strong enough today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. <clears throat> now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Amalekites were there and the cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. <laughs> He's 85 years old. <clears throat> the young men of Israel back then should be ashamed of themselves. Because they were all complaining and muttering. And this utopia showed them how to do it. But again, look at it. His faith is not in himself. He says, yes, I'm still strong enough. Yes, I can still do it. He says, but God made me a promise. He's going su to supply my needs. This thing is going to be sorted out. I'm going to take it. He was a warrior in his 40s. And he was ready to fight for God's promises. But he was still a warrior at 85. Because he never gave up on God's promises. Why did he have a different spirit? Because he was different. Amen? Amen. He was different but in a godly way. Caleb was a generous giver. <clears throat> the land that God gave Caleb as an inheritance contained very precious springs of water. Now you must understand... Even though this was the promised land, there were still a lot of desert areas. And water is a very precious commodity. So the land that he went and fought for and that he conquered and that he eventually took as his own 
It contained a lot of precious springs. After waiting for 45 years for his promise, the first thing he did was take some of that land and give it away to his brother. He's waited 45 years. Trekking around the mountain for 45 years. And finally he's there. Most people would be like, mine, 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 you know. Not this man. He's like, hey, boot. That's yours. And that's yours. And that's yours. Man, I want to tell you something. God's smile went from here to here. He was like, yes, I'd like you, man. <laughs> he cared about people he saw people's needs and he didn't mind giving Caleb was a man of vision from the first day that he heard about God's promise he chose to believe it there's a lot of promises out there there's not a lot of people that choose to believe it, to take it, to see it. Even after 40 years in the desert, it did not quench his fire or his passion. <clears throat> Neither trials, nor tribulation, nor hardship, nor betrayal could get him to let go of the vision that God had shared with him. <laughs> That's why he walked on the land of God's promise and the rest of Israel did not I'm gonna go out on a limb today and I'm gonna to say to you that things have not changed much in all these years if there was like let's say 400 or 500 or a million Israelites I don't know the numbers I'm sure somebody will correct me I'm sure but let's say there was a million of them two made it to the promised land what would the percentages look like today? Worse. Probably not much different, maybe even worse. I want to say something to you. <clears throat> we all need this kind of a spirit. And when you find this kind of a spirit, it's rare. Let's quickly recap. Just quickly. And then you're going to you're going to memorize this and you're going to ask God to help you to get to the place where this man was because it's not impossible the first thing that he had is he had a lot of faith say with me faith okay. so what do we need more of we need more faith the second thing that he had he was a man of perseverance. Say with me, perseverance. perseverance. In other words, we're not just going to give up. We're going to push through. Even when things look dark and things are horrible, we're going to go, we're going to go, we're going to go. He was a man of perseverance. The next thing is he was a man of encouragement. In other words, when you see people around you falling, let's once again come back to the fact that God sees us as we're running a race. When we run a race, sometimes the other athletes fall. Now, most of humanity will just be, well, it is a race after all, so bye-bye, you know, and there we go. But that's not how God operates. We stop, we pick them up, and we carry them along. You know, it's like these American oaks, like, leave no man behind. We should have the same attitude, leave no one behind. When people start falling by the wayside, we try our best to pick them up. Okay, if somebody tells you to just protect or whatever, there's nothing you can do about that. But somebody that's trying and they fall and they try and they fall, you, you help them. He was a man of encouragement. The next thing is he was a man of loyalty. Amen? Say with me, loyalty. A very scarce commodity in today's society. Next thing, I'm going to say he was a warrior. Say with me, warrior. warrior. Because he was not afraid to make war. At 85 years of age, he said to them, bring my stuff, today we fight. Okay. Caleb was a generous giver. Repeat after me, generous, generous. giver. Generous. Caleb was a man of vision. Repeat after me, vision. vision. When God looked at Caleb, 
God saw many attributes in Caleb that he did not see in the other people. God's way of explaining it was to say, upon this man is a different spirit. I want to say something to you. It takes a different spirit to rise to the top. It takes a different spirit to conquer in the face of trials, tribulation and adversity. It takes a different spirit to go from hearing a promise from God to living a promise from God. It takes a fighter. It takes commitment. It takes dedication. It takes hard work. It takes encouragement. It takes kindness to those that are suffering around you. Caleb had all of these things. You know, worldwide, there have been pastors for the last how many hundreds of years that have preached about this man because of his different spirit. His life not only touched the people around him back then, but his life is still touching our lives today. And that's God's blessing on him for who he was. Is it possible for you to have that different spirit? None of the things I read to you are a train smash to have. It takes attitude that's right. It takes hard work and a willingness to change if you need to change something. All of you can do it. All of us can do it. How's about we pray and we ask God to help us to have a different spirit? Take a answer. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, it is so encouraging and it is such a blessing to read about a man by the name of Caleb. I never knew him personally, but I feel like I got to know him while I preached the sermon. It would have been wonderful if I could shake his hand and maybe one day in the heavens I will. This man was different. And I'm not so sure that it was the fact that you made him different. He chose to be different. It's easy to choose to go with the masses. It's difficult to stand up and say, I'm going to be different. But this man had an attitude and a character that was completely different from the norm out there. We all need <coughs> this character. We all need this spirit. Lord, today we ask you for your grace and for your favor. And for the power of God to work within us, for us to truly cultivate a different kind of spirit because it is needed in the world today. Thank you, Spirit of God, that you help us and that you work with us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. Well, bless God. Did anybody learn something? Amen.